everybody. Welcome to Rachel's Reviews. I'm so excited today. I have a very, very special interview here today. Uh, anybody who follows my channel will know how exciting this is for me. But I'm here talking with animator Tom Moore. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Hi there. Thanks so much for coming on and being willing to talk with me. Yeah, well, I'm delighted. I'm glad we were able to do it at some, somewhat of a reasonable time zone since I'm in Los Angeles. Right. <laughs> yes, this worked out just perfect. And it was so fortuitous since we had just done our indie animation podcast, me and Stanford, on uh, your films. And it just so worked out that we got to talk to you. I'm so grateful. Yeah. Well, thanks for reaching out. Yeah, it's good. The power of the internet, eh? It's yeah, good. isn't it amazing? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> That's how we were able to discover your review for Song of the Sea. Uh, the writer, Will Collins, sent it to me back whenever you did it, and it was really touching. It was really one of the most emotional reviews that we'd had, and it really meant a lot to us. So it's great to chat to you properly. Well, that's amazing because I, I was actually just listening over to that review, and I'm like, oh boy, because it was when I was just starting. Right. And uh, so, like, the sound quality wasn't very good, but it was from the heart. So I. Oh, it meant a lot. It means a lot that that it's just amazing. There's, as I've certainly found this week, there's a lot of toxicity out there. But isn't it great the way that that we can connect? What is it about the internet that makes people become so mean? I just don't understand it. No, I don't understand it either. That's for sure. The worst thing anybody could do was start to imagine that the internet is the real world, because yeah. it's just not. It's I don't know. It's like some kind of mean playground or something where people. <laughs> Um, the worst sides of them come out. And I really don't think that's, that's representative of, of humanity in general. I really hope no. not. No. And, and to be honest, most of what I've been through this last week uh, has been very affirming. I mean, I've gotten so much support from so many people, but, but yeah, it was, uh, it, it's, it's definitely shakes you sometimes for sure. For sure. Yeah. I can definitely imagine. I thought I had pretty thick skin and then... Huh. I gave a negative review to a DC film on Rotten Tomatoes and woo! <laughs> it's it was... interesting how people take it personally when it's yeah. corporate, like megalith, you know? Right. They probably take it more personally than the filmmakers or something. Yeah, oh, I, I think so. <laughs> it's... Anyway, so yeah, that was an adventure. But uh, <laughs> so can you introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us what inspired you to become an animator to have your career? Well, uh, like a lot of animators, I always really enjoyed drawing and I always sort of saw that as part of my of who I was and what I did. And uh, when I was a kid, I got a lot of encouragement from my from my parents, you know, but also when I was a kid, the Don Bluth studio opened in Dublin. And there was always sort of rumors back in the 80s in Ireland of, of, you know, somebody who would have a friend of a friend who worked there. And um, it sounded amazing to me that you could actually work as an animator. Like, I, it kind of opened up my eyes, seeing stuff about it on Irish TV, opened up my eyes to the idea that cartoons were made by somebody, you know, and that there was people whose job it was to draw the cartoons. So that really inspired me. Um, and then as I got older, I joined Young Irish Filmmakers in Kilkenny and we got to make our own movies and that was very exciting. And I found a group of friends and we all loved comics and animation and movies and started to make our own comics and stuff. And that just naturally evolved to going to study animation in Ballyferman College. So it was a very linear path. I, I think yeah. I've been wanting to be an animator since I was very young. That's so cool. Did you have favorite animated films that you, that really inspired you? You know, they changed over time. Like as a young uh -huh. kid, of course, it was the classic Disney and seeing the Don Bluth movies and stuff. And then as I got older and I went to college and stuff, I started to become much more inspired by Eastern European animation and obviously all the cool stuff that was still happening in America. But I also yeah. discovered Japanese animation, yeah. Studio Ghibli. And I also discovered the work of Richard Williams, which really inspired me in college. He was making this movie called The Thief and the Cobbler, which he never got finished. But as much as that film was inspiring, that unfinished version of the film that I saw in college, what the animation was inspiring, he was inspiring because there was a documentary on the same VHS tape that the movie had been kind of bootlegged it on, onto, the unfinished version of it. And it was a documentary that had been on British TV. I'd never seen it. And it was Dick Williams talking about animation. Yeah. And some of the things he said about how animation could be an art form were really inspiring for us. So that was a big influence as well at the time. That is really cool. Yeah, I can totally see how 
those influences in your work. So that's real. That's really neat. Uh, yeah, it's with the seek out the unfinished thief and the cobbler almost as an artifact of what yeah. animation, where animation was at, and how it was like a time capsule of hand drawn animation at a point when it was really dying off. You know. Yeah, we need to do that for the indie obscure animation series. Uh, that's super obscure case, for it's sure. Really <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so how did you meet uh, Paul Young and Nora to me? Nora, Nora and Paul were also students in Valley Pharma College. Uh, okay. Nora actually just lived across the street from me. We, we had a small um, apartment in, in Dublin and there was another little um, apartment full of Valley Pharma students on the other side of the street. And we, we all made friends. We were all going to a small college together, so it was hard to avoid each other. Paul had already studied um, illustration, so his work really stood out um, from the rest of us who were a teeny bit younger. Nora and Paul are a tiny bit older than me. It seems less and less as the years go on. You know how when you're 20 and somebody's like 25, that's really impressively, you know, um, more mature. But when you get into your 40s, we all feel like you're the exact same age. But Nora had also worked for a while and had come back to college. So they both, both brought a, a different perspective to the studio. They weren't, or to the college, they weren't just um, sort of animation geeks uh, like a lot of the rest of us. They were sort of teenage animation geeks. They were, they were bringing other life experience, which I think made them stand out for me. So that must have been pretty brave of you guys to start up the Cartoon Saloon back in that. You started in 1999? Yeah, well, Paul and I had started to do work in college, like freelance work that we just sort of did together as a team while we were in college. Um, so that was kind of the origin of it, and the origin of the name. And then I mentioned I'd been a member of Young Irish Filmmakers and myself and another guy, Aidan Hart, who'd been a member of Young Irish Filmmakers and actually quite a lot of people that um, are in the studio today. Um, we all sort of had this dream of making what was going to become Secret of Kells. And Young Irish Filmmakers offered us a chance to have a space after college. And it was a way to kind of almost, I feel, extend college a little bit and keep going. And we really wanted to work in hand-drawn animation. There wasn't a lot of work in hand-drawn animation. But I definitely don't know how brave it was because at the time it felt like um, it was brave, but we were pretty young. And I think we all imagined that we'd eventually just go and get real jobs. And we didn't expect to be doing it for 20 years. <laughs> we didn't really see what we were getting into. Like we certainly didn't say, well, let's go there. Let's move back down to Kilkenny, small town, and just stay there for the rest of our lives and make an animation. I think at the time we thought this is something we do for a little while. And then maybe we go and get jobs in bigger studios. But, you know, as time went on, and thankfully success, we found success eventually. Um, and we kind of dug in. Uh, there was a small group of us that just wanted to keep going all the time. So here we are. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. So you just kind of worked on shorts and different yeah, things? Yeah, well, at the start, I mean, we were very naive. We thought we could go straight into making the movie, you know. And we had to learn everything. Like we had to learn basically oh how to finance the film. We learned all about business side of things as well as we were still learning a lot about animation and all. And I think what basically we ended up doing was we made a like a pitch bible for what was going to become Secret Kells. And we sort of started earning our dues, I guess, you know, working on other people's movies for a while, um, working on commercials, um, doing whatever we could to pay the bills. Like we did illustrations for the Irish school book syllabus, you know, <laughs> whatever work we could find, we just did to pay the bills while we were trying to figure out how to get the movie made, you know. That's really great. I know I love hearing about how things germinate, how things start, and and uh, I don't know. It's just so cool that creative process. I admire you guys for for Very sticking good. with it. And so, yeah. how did you come up with the whole idea for Secret of the Kells? It was originally um, a little bit of a different story, but it was always something we wanted to do, which was we wanted to do something inspired by like Irish art. And uh, we were young kind of Irish artists ourselves and we were looking at um, the fact that hand-drawn animation was seeming to be fading out um, with, with Toy Story and everything coming in in the 90s. And we were so inspired by the Thief and the Cobbler and Eastern European animation and Japanese animation that took influence from their local cultures. And we wanted to do something similar with Irish art, you know. So that was really yeah. the idea. And then we kind of built the story around the Book of Kells, which we sort of felt was the, the high point of Irish visual art anyway. Yeah, so that was a, a, a sort of a story you'd heard a lot growing up and things like that. The, the it idea was more, came from, more from the research, to be honest. I okay. Mean, it wasn't really a story there. There was kind of a history, I suppose, and it wasn't 
particular and then we were kind of mixing that in with influ influences from mythology and stuff. And I mean the story evolved and the script evolved a lot. It took like uh -huh. 10 years from the original idea in 99 to mm -hmm. 2009 to release, you know, to get the film out there. And yeah. over that, you know, it took a lot of twists and turns. That's incredible. So both of your films have little boys as the lead. And I was curious if, is that connecting to yourself at all or the... And my son, yeah, I had my son when I was pretty young as well. So um, okay. he, he was definitely an influence. I mean, Ben was the name of, of my son's name is Ben. It's Brendan for, his long name is Brendan and we called him Ben for short. So he was oh, so of, both. Yeah, both were named for him. But Song of the Sea was very, very modeled on him. And I guess Brendan was a lot more myself because he was a little artist. But uh, yeah, so that was it. And then it's interesting that because Wolf Walkers, our next movie, is Two Little Girls. So that's a bit different. And um, yeah, I kind of based the main character. I mean, I'm co-directing Wolf Walkers with Ross Stewart, but uh, I think he kind of let me base the main character in Wolf Walkers on my wife when she was a little girl. So oh, there's always, interesting. There's always some personal connection to these characters yeah. so that you kind of live with them for long enough. You know? Cool. Yeah. I, well, I'm really excited about that. Uh, so Os, Osling in the, in the Kells. So she's a very like soft character for uh, a very sweet, soft character, I, at least in my opinion. And I was curious how you kind of came up like most fantasies. I feel, especially these days, all the female characters kind of have to be bold and, and uh, you know, kick butt yeah. and whatever. And yeah. I was just, curious how you kind of came up with her character is that part of the lore or the legend or no no actually it was kind of an invention it was interesting i mean i remember when we were talking about how we were going to represent that sort of element of irish mythology and very often in actually poems from that time period ireland would appear you know as like a beautiful woman to the poet or whatever but we thought it made more sense for her to be a little girl like a like i based her actually a lot on my little sister and our relationship growing up and we sort of thought she was like a little a cheeky little sister to Brendan kind of character rather than any kind of mother figure or love interest or whatever uh -huh. but we made her a little bit younger than him and kind of kind of fun character that's always best in him and stuff so um yeah it's just more of a um how that how that energy or how that certain spirit would appear to little Brendan is how we uh -huh. think well, so Secret of the Cows, it feels very relevant to me to today with this, uh, with this whole just Kellex just fear uh, of every, of everything. Walls against people and stuff. Yeah. yeah, walls and everything else. And I was curious, at the time, what were you hoping people would kind of take from the story? I think we were mostly, I mean, it was quite a highfalutin idea for our first movie. And I think what yeah. we were mostly trying to talk about was how art can kind of bring people together. And that's why we had monks from all over the world. And we wanted to show sort of a, that there was some hope in, in, in art and hope in creating some art, even in the face of danger and in the face of fear, um, rather than being closed down and, and closing in on yourself to open up a bit to the world. That, I guess, was the broad sort of theme that we were playing with. Yeah, I can see that because uh, I don't know Selick is such a he's just completely ruled by his fear, yeah, and uh, he he lets that you know control his 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 whole life, and that's an easy thing to let happen, especially when you have scary things like the threat is real. He's right to be scared. Yeah, he's quite an interesting character. I think when I look back on it, he's almost you could almost imagine he's almost a hero of the movie too. You know. He goes through uh -huh. the biggest transformation, I think, which is always interesting. Yeah, yeah that that's true. That happens to me a lot. Sometimes there's these peripheral characters, usually adult men characters, that I end up looking back on and going, oh, wow, he's an interesting character. Yeah, right. So so how did you develop your relationship with Bruno Colas and Kia? They Kia, made yeah. Kia. Kia. Yeah. yeah, I actually was just in France last week with them, which was lovely. We were at a festival and we were talking about this. Basically, Keela were, we felt at the time, doing something similar to what we were trying to do with Irish art. They were doing with Irish music. They were doing amazing stuff with traditional Irish music and um, sort of, let's say, um, reinventing it. And uh, we asked them to get involved. And, and very early on, I think in 99 or 2000, we asked them to get involved. Um, but they were a band. They weren't composers. And when we started to work with our French co-producer, Didier, Didier Bruner, who was a... Um, he was a, a very successful French producer. He'd done like the triplets of Belleville, for example. 
and uh, he suggested we work with Bruno. And I hadn't been familiar with Bruno's work, or at least I didn't realize I was familiar with his work. I knew his work from Michael Cosmos, and he had just done a film called Boy You Want to Be Fair. And at that time, he was working on the music for Coraline with Henry Selleck. So um, when we met him and heard his music, we realized he was bringing in influences from a lot of traditional music from around the world. And him and Keela kind of hit it off, and it was a great collaboration. And so that sort of continued. We're working with them again yeah. now. We worked on Song of the Sea. So it's just a, one of those really fortuitous collaborations that's just blossomed. Yeah. That's really great. I love that. Yeah, I love their music. It's so so calming and and i hope that we can get a uh, song of the sea uh the soundtrack i don't think it's on he, itunes he, yeah i think Keela have released it on their label as like a cd so i think you can i think you can get the song of the sea soundtrack um, on cd from our okay. website yeah oh yeah if i check from your website yeah. i was i was looking on amazon i didn't see it but but maybe i missed it yeah, check Cartoon Saloon website because usually anything that does exist, we, we usually have. So okay. it means at least physical copies. Good, good. Okay, great. Uh, and it must have been pretty great to work with Brendan Gleeson. Yeah, he was also yeah. a great early supporter of ours. Yeah. Like, yeah, and uh, yeah, he was awesome. And I mean, at the time, he was on the Ascendant. You know, we met him again very early 2000s and his career was really just, I mean, he was pretty established Irish actor, but he was starting to get bigger and bigger movies. And uh, when he agreed to do a voice, that was fantastic for us as well. Yeah. And he helped us do a promotional trailer and all early on. So he was a great supporter. That's really cool. So what was it like when you got nominated for the Oscar? That must have been I mean, crazy. It was, it was lovely, Rachel. I mean, it was really surreal because we'd been, um, you know, we'd, we'd finished the movie and I, I felt like I'd spent most of my 20s trying to get the thing made. And I mean, yeah. it had some success in festivals and I was pretty gratified with that. Um, I don't think we ever realistically expected it to be a huge like, blockbuster hit, but we we sure. we had worked very hard on it for a long time, and there was a little bit of anticlimax at, at the beginning, and then slowly, slowly, it was doing well in festivals. And sort of by the end of its festival run, I think in two thousand and nine, we felt that's as far as we were going to go. I think we got nominated for an Annie and the European Film Award, and for us that meant a lot. And we were like, yeah. okay, we kind of got I mean, the last thing on our minds was the Oscars. We just didn't think we'd have hope, especially because. That was a great year for animation. It just yeah. the scene. And we didn't, we were really, honestly, we're not even thinking of the Oscars. And we had a tiny distributor here, G Kids, who were only just getting started and they barely qualified it. And I think even for them, it was a huge surprise. Even though they worked very hard, it was very grassroots, very guerrilla. So I think even they were surprised that it got nominated. So for all of us, it was just this amazing vindication. And it was just, I mean, it, I mean it's 10 years later. And it's just still surreal and amazing that it was recognized at that level. And it was a great celebration of all the work that all the people had put into it over the years. I mean, because so many of us had sort of dreamt that dream for a long time since we were in college. So it really meant a lot yeah. to be recognized that way. Yeah, I mean, it really, I've long said it's the best year ever for animation. I heard that ever. on your podcast. I think yeah. you're right. I Incredible. Look back, when I look back on it, I think at the time we thought so. But looking back on it, like a lot of things, you can kind of see it clearer in retrospect. And it was just an amazing year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you certainly deserved it. So uh, so after all of this, coming up with Song of the Sea, how, how hard was that, uh, you know, to kind of have your sophomore project? Like, was that? Yeah. Uh, what was that like? right? Yeah, the difficult second album and all that. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, you know, it had been, it was an idea, a story that I'd been sort of germinating for a long time that I'd had in my mind since I, like a holiday I took with my son, even before we started full production of Secret of Cows. So thankfully it was there tipping off in the background all the way through um, the production of Secret of Cows, you know. So I kind of, I kind of felt natural to keep going with it. I suppose there was a bit of a wobble. There was a couple of moments where I thought, well, maybe now is the time if I'm going to go and get a real job, I should do it after Secret of Kells and I wasn't sure if you know buckling in and doing another feature indie style on a wing and a prayer like we all are uh, yeah do but I think the Oscar nomination really cemented the decision that yeah we were going to keep going and this idea that I'd been germinating it was time to really you know give it socks and give it a, give it a go and I'm really glad I did I think that was a turning point in my career and it, you know it goes back to the Oscar nomination because some of the people I met out here at the time they were saying, no, no, don't come over here. You keep doing what you're doing. We want to see more of what you're doing, which was an amazing validation and encouragement, you know? So, mm -hmm. so you said you have a sister. So was that, that was inspirational mm -hmm. with um, 
building the relationship between Ben and, Sh- and Shirsha? Exactly. It was an extension. What I started playing with, with Brendan and Ashling was really with Ben and Saoirse. It was very much like my uh, antagonistic relationship. With my, I was the oldest and I had three <laughs> young sisters. But my next oldest sister, Kathy, who was closest in age to me, she was always, always annoyed that she wasn't the oldest. She felt she should be the one in charge. And so there was always antagonism there. Some of the mean things Ben does to his sister that people go, oh, it's a bit harsh. How did you make the character so mean? I kind of have to, I have to hang my head in shame because a lot of that stuff was the milder things we did. (laughs) (laughs) Like tying her up with a dog leash and stuff and dragging her along. (laughs) I have an older brother. I understand what you speak. (laughs) Exactly then, right. That is really funny. So, was there anything in particular that drew you to doing a story that was so focused on grieving and loss? Um, yeah, I mean, there was stuff going on in my, amongst my family and friends at the time. You know, there was some, some stories like that closer to home. I was also thinking a lot at the time about how stories connect us to our heritage, our culture. And I, at the time, it was really the height of the Celtic Tiger in Ireland. And I felt we were losing, on a grander scale, um, something in our culture by wholeheartedly chasing, you know, capitalism and materialism. Um, and I thought maybe stories might root us back towards that. So it was a personal and then a bigger sort of yeah. metaphorical inspiration going on. Yeah. Huh, I didn't even think of it from that broader level. That's interesting. Yeah, that was a lot of, that was, that was, to be honest, again, I knew that was a very highfalutin thing to be thinking about. And I knew that was a downfall I felt on Secret of Kells, that it was a bit too highbrow. And I thought that uh, seeing the, that the Selkie stories so often were dealing with loss and grief and seeing that so close to home in my own family and amongst my friends um, made me realize that that was a much deeper emotional, personal story. And what I'd kind of learned on, on Secret of Kells is that I wanted to tell stories that were much more rooted in very authentic um, human experience. Um, and I, I just felt that was something I needed to work through and, and work out. And so I do think the dominant thing was more the, the character story and the, the, uh-huh. story. the other one was much more in the background or more kind of subtextual. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. When, when I saw the movie, when it, it happened is my, uh, my cousin had passed away and she had two little boys mm. and them, one of them sp- spoke at her funeral just about how angry he was and it was it was brutal it was really sad and uh and the it really connected to me with ben as a character and i thought that he had kind of every right to be sort of angry that uh, she was just gone like that and he never got to say goodbye and uh it just really connected with me on that emotional i thought i felt it was very emotionally true to how a child because it's so easy in movies to kind of make your children child characters kind of perfect and yeah. the perfect like response adult's and, yeah an adult's idea of child or something yes yeah. that they're kind of inspirational figures and and whatever and and this felt way more grounded to me of like the way a child would actually respond to the loss of his mother and this mute sister that was the cause of the loss of his mother all that would be i think very very it was very emotionally true to me and i really appreciate that your film helped me to get through that tough period and and, and that experience no that means i mean that's amazing and that will who was the writer and nora was head of story i think they all put a lot of their own uh, yeah. personal stuff in and i think we heard that from a few people and that meant a huge amount to us because yeah you know that the movie had really resonated yeah that's when movies are are important and they actually mean something to with all this uh so one thing that impressed me about the movie is that i think it's impressive in both films actually is how you're able to use irish lore without sort of feeling like you need to explain it you just kind of have it (laughs) and people say that all the time but i always think that we're being pretty um didactic i always feel like it's, it's <laughs> clear like I, I feel like we're telling as much as you know people need to know to understand yeah. the story no yeah, you I, are yeah, yeah. And I, I guess we take inspiration from like miyazaki but i always try yeah. to be a little bit less because sometimes miyazaki's work has frustrated me where i'm like wait what 
and I need I don't know enough I mean I just accept it because it's like in the language of the storytelling that he's doing yeah. but I know that there's usually like some cultural relevance that I'm missing but I try not to be that or obtuse yeah. I mean not on purpose anyway but yeah I know what you mean and definitely on yeah. Song of the Sea there was a lot of and this happened again with Wolfwalkers where we sort of felt should we put this like intro or we tell people all the legends and explain it all and it always feels a little dry and a bit of a strange thing to try and tack on and then you try and put that exposition into the mouth yeah. of the characters and it doesn't feel true to them so you just have to trust that this stuff is so grounded in a like, monomyth as Joseph Campbell talks about that yeah. people relate to it even if they don't know the details of this mythology. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the, for instance, the fairies in Sonar of the Sea, like we don't really need to know the intricacies of that part of lore. Uh, we just need to know that they're kind of nutty and funny and, and <laughs> yeah. that's it. You know, that's all you need. Yeah. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, angst in Ireland about how we're represented. Like, by- Oh no, really? <laughs> Like leprechauns and you know this kind of stuff and, and i suppose that there's a kind of for me there was a bit of a response to that because the fairies are there's so many different stories and i tried to show that these were like um more like the the kind of trickster kind of fairies from the, the, the more like the folk tales from around the time of yates uh wb yates but uh-huh. at the end when they're transformed we sort of see them as these like um, Celtic gods or you know these Celtic um, myth- mythological figures that they'd originally been and had just sort of slowly sort of been demoted to these kind of comedy characters so we were there's a there's a deeper level to that stuff just at least visually you know yeah because that's where a lot of fantasy kind of loses me is that they're they're just so caught up in sort of their world that they uh, that it becomes very exposition heavy and yeah. very very dull for me and yeah. uh, and it's it's always an interesting experience to me because i'm like why am i bored when it's all of this you think oh it's all this fantasy it's all this this yeah. you know i sh- that's the last thing you'd think i would be bored but I, in the 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 visuals and the world building can only entertain me and some people they can entertain them for a long time other people like myself uh that that will be really cool for i don't know five ten minutes that i'm like uh checking my watch here like it's yeah, just it matter i, I mean know. i love star trek for example and there are people who just love deep diving deep into the lore yeah, of, yeah. you know figuring out how does the spaceship work and everything and for me that's not important at all it's always been the themes right. and characters right. that bring back to that and i don't really care that much I, I appreciate that it's grounded in some sort of scientific you know mumbo jumbo yeah. that's interesting but yeah absolutely, i agree with you totally and i mean to reach beyond the sort of let's say the geek kind of culture yeah the the general culture you really have to be talking about universal human emotional yeah. experiences and not you know yeah. arcane lore yeah i agree completely like one of the things i think that's so brilliant about peter jackson's lord of the rings movie is that the the little um prologue at the beginning gets out all of that lore in like a you know where he's like they're talking all about forging the rings and all that stuff and the different groups and who makes up what and all that stuff is just boom we're gonna handle it right up front and now we're gonna entertain you for nine hours (laughs) true that's true i think there are some like super hardcore lord of the ring fans who love the books who kind of complain that stuff has been left right right did a fantastic job because i mean at the end of the day a movie is a different thing than a book you can spend longer or you can skip over parts in a book or read it quicker and you know yeah. it's different or you can have appendices and all that stuff in a book where in a movie you need to just keep things moving and you need to stay focused on the characters so yeah i think you yeah. Did great. yeah yeah so how did you come up with the idea of maka as a character oh yeah i'm, I'm not kind of remembering there was a lot she was different at different times as that story evolved that, that movie also we bought much more quickly than Kelt, but Will and I and Nora too, I said a story, we worked through quite a lot of different variations. Um, and Maka at one point was um she she was basically what, what we basically hit upon was that she was hanging in there as a character that it was in early drafts and we had a lot of different characters from mythology in early drafts. But once we started linking once we started trimming the story down so that it was just what we were talking about all about the family and the human story of the family the only fantasy characters that we could justify keeping in of all the characters that we had in there were the ones that sort of reflected the family and then we realized we could go even further and that 
the characters could literally be mirrors of what was going on in the family and that the fantasy and mythology would be almost in the way the way Ben, who knew these stories from when he was a tiny kid, from his mum, would half remember them and sort of twist them into a meaningful uh, way that would resonate what's going on in his family. So Maka really became like a supercharged version of the grandmother and what the grandmother was doing within the family. And so yeah. she was, so, so we sort of like evolved that. And I mean, the, 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 there's a name for owls in Irish called the Kailak Iha, which means the night witch, which I thought was fantastic. And then making her, I mean, Maka is a, is a character in mythology who's everything from like a, like a war goddess to, you know, a, a mother character in other legends. Uh, amazing stories about Maka. But our Maka was more um, sort of a, a symbol of the grandmother and we kind of mushed yeah. her up with the owl mythology. So that was what we did. Yeah, yeah it was really good. I loved it. It was... What was really fun was Fanula Flanagan, who was a fan of Kells, met us when we came out here for Kells. She's an Irish actress who lives out here in Hollywood. And she'd been in Star Trek. She'd been in loads yeah. of, we were fans of her. Yeah. And once she said she'd do the voice, we were kind of writing the part, knowing that she was oh. going to play the part. So that was really fun. So when we hit on the idea that she was going to be this character who was trapping all her emotions in jars, but then at a certain point would have to go through this whole gamut of emotions really quickly in the in the scene in the attic, we were like, oh, if Fanula's really going to get her teeth into this, it's going to be fun. So it was fun to write something yeah. that we could really go crazy with, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really cool. I love that. I love that character because there really is no villain in the film. It's, you know, a mother trying to save her, you know, her son from grief. And, and then she realizes what she's done when she kind of gets out of that, uh, that to trance. Live to life, isn't it? Yeah. Often villains yeah. sort of are the heroes of their own story and they're trying to do their best in a way, weird, twisted work. Right. Yeah. So do you, when you watch your own films, do you get, do you find yourself getting caught up in it at all at all? Or are you just kind of like, I've seen this so many times. I'm, it's, I'm so over this. I kind of get. I watched it. I watched it on the big screen in French last week because they were showing it with uh -huh. the, the festival where Bruno and Colin and Kila and I were there. And it was a bit of a distance from the fact that it was in French. It allowed me to discover it again. My oh, French interesting. Of course, I could follow it. And I, of course, you see certain scenes and you remember the story of the day when you were trying to get it animated and the artist, yeah. all of that stuff. But no, I was, I was getting swept away into the story that time. I'm quite proud of Song of the Sea. I think it's yeah. the definite evolution from Kells. Kells, I, I find it very hard. Kells, I can see as a testament to all the work that everybody put into it. And I can remember all those stories. You know, every, it's like an espresso. It has so many uh, things condensed into it, so many years yeah. of work into it that I still can't really watch it. The Song of the Sea is, interestingly enough, I had some distance there last week. Yeah. Watching. That's uh, that's so great. I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, nice to watch the kids as well. There was kids in the audience, and oh. they were probably not even born when we were making it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and the fact that they're discovering it for the first time was, was yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Well, it, it's really interesting to me about Song of the Sea because uh, there are some people who would say, oh, it's it's very sad. So, you know, kids aren't going to like it. I'm not kidding. Every single child I've ever like interacted with about seeing it and talked with really responded positively to it, including my nieces. All of them really loved it. Uh, so I don't know. I think that, that we don't give kids enough credit sometimes for being able to empathize uh, with a character like Ben and be able to handle a story that will make them cry. I, I don't think that everything has to be the minions or something like that you well, know like it's important that kids kind of learn about that yeah true stories that they're not just pure distraction i mean as much fun as it is just to make like fun uh comedies and stuff for kids you know i think it is important yeah. to be stuff like that too but yeah. uh it's also yeah i remember i have a, i have a favorite chuck jones quote which is that we have to make stuff what was it intelligent enough for children and easy enough for adults to understand right right <laughs> that's good i like that yeah yeah, yeah i uh, I read somewhere or something in my research that part of the appeal of Bambi back in the day was because it was like yeah. had such trauma because about the world back then. Yeah, yeah I mean, because so many kids were losing. I mean, every pretty much every kid lost some kind of family, whether it was you know yeah. a, a, some kind of family member, and so for them to be able to watch Bambi, you know, lose his mother. 
yeah. was uh, was a very positive thing for for them, and was very they you know like really loved the film for that. And, and that's why I love a lot of those early Disney's. They yeah. were really they were truly fairy tales. They weren't like saccharine sort of yeah. princess stories. They were truly fairy tales, and fairy tales yeah. often had a darkness to them that helped kids process difficult emotions. You know? Yeah, I agree. I mean, Snow White when when Grumpy is crying that it's it's emotional yeah. it it does it it was terrified of snow white as a kid actually oh yeah everything yeah yeah the queen and the witch yeah yeah it's so good it i i think it totally holds up it's not great just because of the 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 importance of it but it also uh it the worst is, movie, yeah yeah it's still great so very that's really cool well real quick i just wanted to ask you about uh wolf walkers and uh, so where are you kind of at on that and and you're you're going to release it through apple apple plus yeah yeah i can't talk too much about how it's going to be released but i mean i'm excited okay. about that side of things and uh, it's fantastic that we're doing it with apple because that's a massive platform and yesterday yeah. they, they they kind of showed an image as part of their upcoming lineup so at least we can say that's for sure that yeah going to be platform which is huge for us because it's going to hopefully reach a lot more people that way yeah uh, and that's why I'm here in California, actually. I came out yeah. for that, that announcement, and now I've got some more meetings here in Los Angeles today. Um, but, uh, I mean, Wolf Walkers is about, mm, let's say, I'd say we're about 20 minutes of rough animation done. So we've got another year oh, wow. of work on the visuals. Uh -huh. So probably this time next year, hopefully, we'll have all the music and the sound and everything wrapped up. And it should be looking at a release date sometime early next year, spring or summer next year. Wow. Well, hopefully, that's... Frost, you know, these things, sometimes you hit delays and snags. right. Of, but yeah fingers crossed we're staying on track for now so well i'm very excited for it and uh, we'll definitely have to have you on the podcast uh before that when it comes out and i yeah, hope i get we'll to see it on the big screen and talk about it then. yeah I, I hope you'll get to see it in the big screen too. i have a feeling you might <laughs> yeah oh good, <laughs> That's That's good. All say. <laughs> okay good <laughs> yeah well it, it looks very different in tone and feel from Kells and song of the sea so that's kind of exciting yeah, it's an evolution i'd say it's an evolution i mean uh -huh. the style is evolving and for me it's the third and maybe the last part of this kind of trilogy i'm going to think about what kind of stuff i want to do i know i want to keep yeah. the story folklore and everything but i might do in a different way um, so this feels like a completion of a lot of ideas, visually, story-wise, character-wise, and musically, everything that we've had on the previous movies. So I yeah. hope they all fit together as a piece, but I'll let other people judge that. I hope sure. Well, I, I am so excited, and I just really admire all that you've accomplished, and I was telling Sanford, I said, you know, I just feel like when I watch Song of the Sea, I'm like, I don't know how you make something like that without having a really a really big heart and a really yeah. being a really one and uh so i i just i'm grateful for for you making beautiful art and and so thank everybody at the team there and if anybody else involved wants to come on and talk i'd more than happy to oh that, to that. Be great. that yeah, would be amazing with the oh. rest of the crew i'll say that thank you so much yeah. and we, it means a lot to us that there's people out there who appreciate what we're doing and yeah. uh, that you boost our signal by talking about it on your channel so thank you so much well it's been an honor to talk with you and uh so if people want to follow you on social media whatever how can they do that uh i think cartoonsaloon.ie is our website okay. and, and there's probably links there we're definitely on facebook and on twitter and you'll find me on twitter but that's like my personal account but uh -huh. definitely, it's in terms of Cartoon Saloon proper, we have an official Facebook page, a Twitter account, and the website. Great. Well, that's really great. I'll have that all in the description section. People can check that out. And thank you again. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you're listening, please uh, yeah, follow the podcast. And if you're listening on iTunes, please give us your ratings and reviews. Really appreciate it. If you're listening on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And uh, thanks again, Tom. This was really wonderful. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. And we will definitely have to talk again. Yes. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot. Okay. Have bye. Bye-bye.